Ward here. Uh, so thanks for joining us for the Science of Threatened and Endangered Species. So today is our second to last um, webinar in this series. So next week we will be talking about wetlands and I will actually not do a lot of talking next week. Um, some of you might be like, yay, and some of you might be like, oh darn. But um, so next week we will have uh, Ted LaGrange, who is our wetland biologist here in the Lincoln office, and then Grace Gard, who is our aquatic education specialist, be doing some talking about um, wetlands and what animals you can find in wetlands, what is a wetland, the different types of wetlands, and kind of just a broad overview of wetlands in Nebraska. So very cool. Make sure you join us next week, uh, 3 to 4, same time, Thursday, um, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. So. But today we're going to be ahead and talk about uh, threatened and endangered species. So I'm going to go ahead and let my co-host really quickly introduce herself. So Amanda. Yeah, my name is Amanda Philby. I'm an education specialist out in Western Nebraska, and I'm just here to be um, the bouncer. Um, so any questions you type in the chat, I'll make sure to kind of um, ask them uh, for when Monica's got a break in her presentation. Um, and I hope everybody's staying warm today because it's pretty, pretty chilly out there. So Awesome. Well, thank you, Amanda. And like she said, you guys can either um, put in the chat to everyone in the group um, if you have a question or a good comment that's topical related, um, or you can either private message Amanda or me. So, and we will just get to them when we can. So odds are, if you have a question, um, someone else might have that same question. So please feel free to type that in the chat. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Um, hopefully everyone sees the big the big view and not the presenter mode. Awesome. I think I figured out the setting on my computer. It was because I only have one screen and don't do two. So, all right. So today we're going to go ahead and talk about science of threatened and endangered species. So this has always been a big topic and it always kind of comes down to like a gloom and doom kind of situation, um, but it doesn't have to be. There's some great success stories even here in Nebraska. Um, and there are some very um, interesting stories with these guys as well. So. Um, um, we will mention a little bit about things like uh, leopards and polar bears and African elephants. Those animals are all fantastic. They all have a place in the ecosystem and they have a great niche. However, we do have a lot of threatened and endangered species here in our own state, in our backyard. So um, within the state of Nebraska, we have 30 threatened and or endangered species. And we will be talking about um, some of them later on in the presentation today. So I just want everyone to keep in mind that uh, since we are in Nebraska, we want to talk about some of the animals that we have within our state. Um, and a lot of our surrounding states also have those animals, um, and they have different types of populations. They might have a lot more than we do. They might have a lot less than we do. Um, but we really want to talk about Nebraska because this is what you're most likely to find in your backyard instead of a African elephant or a leopard or a tiger or something like that. As cool as those animals would be to see in your backyard, you're more likely to see maybe a swift fox, or you're more likely to see a pallid surgeon in the uh, Missouri River. So we'll talk about a lot of those animals today. All right, so again, uh, just make sure that if you have any comments or any questions in the chat that they're related to the topic at hand, um, just everyone be nice to each other. Otherwise, we will unfortunately have to remove you. But again, I have not had a problem at all this time. So thank you everyone for being on your best behavior. All right, so before we get along um, to talking about some of our threatened and endangered species, I want to make sure that we all have a good view and a good definition of what a threatened and or endangered species actually is. So when we talk about a threatened species, there's kind of a three tier um, level or a pyramid. And when we talk about this, so threatened is kind of at the bottom. That doesn't mean that those animals by any means are safe, um, but it goes threatened, endangered, and then extinct. And I think we all know what happens when an animal becomes extinct. They're gone and gone forever. Um, so we don't want that to happen. So when we place an animal on a threatened species list, according to the Endangered Species Act, we'll talk about exactly what that is later. It's a very important important piece of documentation, um, but it says that a threatened species is any species that is likely to become an endangered species within the foreseeable future throughout all or a significant portion of its range. Um, so basically what it's saying is it could become an endangered species, and if it becomes an endangered species, it could become extinct. Again, we don't want that to happen. Um, so some of the examples that you might have heard about in the world, um, as far as the threatened species, we have the Franklin's bumblebee, a common sawfish, 
fish, an angel shark, um, the Sumatran rhino. There's lots of species um, that are out there in the world, unfortunately, that are threatened. When we talk about what is threatened in Nebraska, some animals that come to mind are mountain plover, the southern flying squirrel, uh, lake sturgeon. It's a really cool flower called a ute lady's tressus. Um, it's really hard to say and very hard to spell, um, but it is a very pretty flower. And then also the western massasauga, which is what I have a photo of here. Um, this is a lot of them. This is a little um, bunch of hatchlings here, but um, that is one of the threatened species that we have in Nebraska. Within our state, we have nine what we call state listed species as threatened, and and then we have five federal and state listed. So the difference between that is when I say this is a Nebraska threatened species, that means that Nebraska itself is the only one that really sees it as um, becoming endangered within our state, within those state boundaries. When we say of something that is a also a federally listed threatened species, that means that it is on the larger list of um, places within the United States. So it's not just looking at something in Nebraska, it's looking at all of its range. Um, so in Nebraska, we have nine just separate ones that we consider to be threatened in the state of Nebraska. And then there's five of them that are both listed as a threatened species in Nebraska and a uh, threatened species in the entire nation. So kind of a little bit different there. All right, so what does it mean to be threatened and what does that look like in a perspective? So out of all the species, there's about 35,000 species, which keep in mind, that's only 28% of the species that have actually been assessed. So 28% of them are, of those 35,000 are threatened. So in the world, about 40% of all amphibians are threatened, 20% of all reptiles, 15% of birds. Those, it might not look like a huge number, but when you look at some of those like sharks and rays, the conifers, the corals, um, even amphibians and reptiles, you're nearing that one third mark. That is saying that one third of all sharks and rays are threatened and that is just threatened. There could be more that are endangered as well. All right, so an endangered species then, according to the ESA, says that any species which is in danger of becoming extinct throughout all or a significant portion of its range. Um, so again, just that tier level. So a threatened be could become endangered, endangered would become extinct. Um, some of the examples in the world of some uh, very popularly known endangered species, things like the African wild dog, the Asian elephant, um, green sea turtle, the lowland gorilla, the blue whale, um, some of them that we have here in Nebraska, uh, whooping cranes, which is what I have pictured here, um, swift foxes, pallid sturgeon, American burying beetle, the scale, cell, scale shell mussel, um, the saltwort, which is a plant that we have here um, in the saline wetlands of Nebraska or in Lancaster County. And then within Nebraska, all of our 30 species, 11 of them are listed as a state and federal endangered species, whereas five of them alone are just listed as a Nebraska endangered species. All right, so what does this look like in perspective? So this is for um, either in the US or just in the world. Um, amphibians are the largest group of animals that are endangered. About one third of all amphibians are known to be at risk for extinction. So this is, they're past that threatened stage. They are up there at the endangered or highly endangered. Um, birds, about 2% of them, um, that doesn't sound like a lot, but still 2% are extremely high risk. 31% uh, of all birds just in the United States are endangered. Uh, fish, about 39% of all fish in the United States. And then globally, 21% of all fish in the world are endangered. Um, so I won't read through all of these, but the numbers get very high. The one that is very astounding is the plants one. That's more, that's about three quarters of all of our plants um, that are evaluated with extinction threats. Um, so people might be saying, well, you know, who needs plants? Plants provide lots and lots of resources for lots of different species. So if we lose them, we're going to lose a lot of other species as well. All right, so when we talk about listing these species under threatened or endangered, how do you know which one to do and how does this happen? Um, so when we look at how to decide if an animal should be become uh, threatened or endangered, 
how do we look at deciding if it needs to be evaluated or if it needs to be a threatened or endangered species? Um, so there's a couple of things that the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Endangered Species Act actually looks at. Um, so there's five different things here. One of them is that they are pre present or threatened destruction, modification um, of their habitat or range. So this is the largest one, it's habitat loss. If they are losing a lot of habitat, odds are they are gonna need to be placed on that endangered list or threatened list. Um, a lot of it also overutilization um, for commercial purposes, scientific purposes, or even educational purposes. So um, basically over harvesting, overtaking, um, disease or predation. Um, there's an inadequacy of existing um, regulatory mechanisms. Um, this is basically saying that there's not a lot of management and there's not a lot of regulations. A great example of this is going to be reptiles. There are very, very few regulations when it comes to um, take and trade of reptiles and um, just overall management of reptiles. Um, and then other natural or man-made factors that are going to affect its continued existence. So is this something that um, the climate is changing, so these animals are going to need to be put on a special list. Is this something that man is doing? Um, so there's lots of different reasons, but these are the five overarching categories in deciding whether an animal needs to be listed or not. All right, so how do you go about if those animals meet those listing criteria, um, how do you go about then getting them on this list? Um, so there's two different ways. Um, one of them, there's a petition process. So any person, any interested person or group can actually petition the Secretary of the Interior for a terrestrial or a land mammal, or if it is a marine life, you could go to the Secretary of Commerce. Um, so basically, they're going to say, I think that the um, common bed bug should be added to the endangered species list because of these reasons. This is my petition for that animal. Or I believe that the blue whale, I think there's enough of them now, so we could probably take that off the endangered species list. Um, that is your petition, not saying that it's going to go, but that is your petition to get that animal either listed or delisted. Um, there's also a candidate assessment process. So basically, this is very similar but instead of having someone just a common citizen, these are biologists and um, in that field saying, okay, from our research, from our surveys, this animal probably needs to be listed because of these scientific reasons. Um, so again, all of these have to go through rigorous processes and not saying that a biologist says, okay, I believe that this animal should be listed. It's gonna go automatically just because they're a biologist. They still have to go through those rigorous processes. Hey, Monica. Yeah, we had a, a quick question. You talked about federally listing um, species and then also uh, state listed, um, but there was a question about the IUNC listing. Yeah, um, that is actually where I got a lot of my information. Um, so the list that I had there at the beginning, the threatened versus endangered, um, if you just Google search IUCN, this is the long, huge global list of everything that is on their list as far as threatened and endangered. So um, most of these organizations work very closely together, but that IUCN is the entire um this is the catch-all, the group to go to to find if something is endangered or threatened. And it is a huge global listing. That's a good question. All right. So if an animal is petitioned um, and it makes it and it gets on this list, what does that mean? Does that just mean that they get money? Does that protect their habitat? What actually happens? Um, so if they meet those needs and they get on this designated list, um, then they are eligible for a critical habitat designation. That is the main reason that we see endangered and threatened species is because of habitat loss um, or deforestation or fragmentation, whatever you're looking at. Um, but these animals then are eligible for that critical habitat designation. So then the benefits that they get for being on this list is they get protection from federal activities. They get protection from critical habitat being destroyed or really modified. And then there's restrictions on take and trade. Um, for instance, the Sumatran rhino, um, or, well, at one time, the black rhino, um, what they would do is um, if this animal is on that list, basically you cannot touch it. You cannot take, you cannot trade. Um, it's a black market item. Um, doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but um, overall that, it, that should be the conservation benefits for those animals. What's that flower that you have on your slide? 
I have no idea. It's very pretty though, isn't it? Yeah, it's we had that question orchid. in the chat. So yeah, yeah. some orchid. Yeah, but, okay, that's a very cool. good question. It is some type of tropical orchid. That is all I know. I am definitely not a plants person. So if anyone knows, please feel free to put that in the chat. All right, so then earlier we said, okay, we're gonna talk about Endangered Species Act or sometimes we call it the ESA. This is actually a fairly new piece of legislation. Um, it was back in 1973 that it was enacted by Congress and it states that the federal government has a responsibility to protect endangered species, threatened species and that critical habitat. So basically if they're on this list, um, this is the ESA saying, or this is Congress saying, hey, the federal government, this is your responsibility to protect these species and their habitat. Um, the list also protects plants and animal species nationally and worldwide. It's not just for the United States. Um, there are two types of species. There's ones that are listed. Um, those are the ones that have been through those processes and have become an actual listed species or a candidate species, which means that, hey, they could be coming up on this list, but it has not been approved yet. All right, so how does a species even become in threatened or endangered? There's about a hundred different ways and all biologists agree that it's not usually just one reason. It's a multitude of reasons. Um, so how they become either threatened or endangered, um, what probably the number one thing, even though I don't have it listed as number one, these aren't in any specific order, is going to be habitat loss. This is the biggest reason that animals will become threatened, endangered, or possibly even extinct. Um, this affects not only animals, but also a lot of plants. Um, because of agricultural spread, mining, deforestation, water extraction, all of these different things can be causes for habitat loss. Um, another one is overhunting and or over harvesting. Um, we will talk about one of our animals in Nebraska, one of our success stories um, that actually had this issue, the over harvesting problem. Um, if anyone has ever heard of the passenger pigeon, um, could not find a picture because no one really has a picture. It was before that time, but this is a drawing of what we assume that it looked like. Um, this is a lot of larger animals will have the problem of overhunting or over harvesting, but also a lot of plants. There's a lot of plants that people would like to put in their house. Um, they're often over harvest and people will then sell them and people will pay a lot of money for specific plants, especially things like orchids. All right, another thing is there's a highly specialized species. Um, a lot of them have specific habitat requirements that if their environmental conditions change or their habitats change, um, it really hurts them. So it's not necessarily their fault. They're just a very highly specialized species. Um, another one is pollution. Um, if you guys remember, um, some of you might remember this back in the 60s, 70s, um, the DDT was a huge issue. Um, it was a pesticide that was used um, for farmland, but it caused a lot of uh, detrimental problems. Uh, bald eagle is actually one of those animals that almost went extinct because of this uh, pesticide, DDT. Um, and peregrine falcons also had an issue too. So what happened was um, it was used in crops to keep off insects and pests, um, but then it would work its way up the food chain. And eventually this bald eagle would eat something that had either eaten DDT itself or had been passed through that food chain with a number of different species. And then um, it not necessarily hurt the adult eagle, but when they went to lay eggs, they did not have enough calcium in their shell and the shells would crack and then they could not reproduce and they could not have little baby eagles. So overall, it really hurt the eagles um, trying to reproduce. It wasn't necessarily the adults, but the eagle uh, babies themselves. Um, another huge reason, invasive species and or competition from those invasive species. So um, if you've ever heard of the brown tree snakes in Guam, they are a huge issue. They eat lots of different native species that are there and they compete with native species. Um, as much as people will fish for them, um, trout, especially in Nebraska, um, some of them are not a native species um, and they not always have bad effects, um, but sometimes they do. Um, for instance, like pheasants have been introduced in Nebraska. They don't really have an issue. They don't really compete with uh, native species, but there are some that are invasive, not supposed to be here, and they do really highly compete, uh, like our zebra mussels um, and also chytrid fungus that has been found in amphibians. 
Uh, human wildlife contact is just a lot of more people around. We're expanding, and that means even more increased contact with wildlife. This could be hitting with a car, um, over hunting. It could be I see a snake in my house and I'm going to kill it because I don't like it. There's lots of different reasons for that human wildlife conflict. There's also disease. Um, for instance, we could talk about the coronavirus up and down, but we're gonna leave that alone today. Um, the Ebola virus um, back in the 90s and the 2000s killed about 5,000 endangered gorillas um, just because they have very similar makeups that we do and the Ebola virus also affected them. Uh, sometimes species have low birth rates. Um, the pallid sturgeon and the lake sturgeon in Nebraska, sometimes they, takes them 25 years to sexually mature and they can't have babies until then. 25 years is a long time. And that means they have probably two or three um, different chances to have babies. So it just is that very low birth rate. There's also a high genetic vulnerability. Um, a great example of this is cheetahs. They have a huge bottleneck in their genes. Um, they just don't have a lot of different genes out there. So they don't have that genetic variability. Um, so they can't evolve over time with the changing environment. Um, so they're very, very uh, vulnerable to different environmental changes, disease, predators, lots of different things. And then a species could just simply be rare. Um, the Sumatran tiger only uses a very, very small amount of um, habitat. Um, the pika, it lives in a very certain distinct altitude range. Um, and now that pollution is so bad in China, it is forcing them to go even higher on the mountain and they just can't survive because it's too cold. There's not enough air. Um, and, and so there's a lot of different reasons how a species could become threatened or endangered. All right. Um, why protect T and E species? Um, a lot of people argue, does it really matter if one frog goes extinct? Does it really matter if this fly goes extinct? What's it going to matter? Um, well, obviously, once they're extinct, they're gone. They're gone forever. We're never getting them back. Um, it also saves a lot of native animals um, that we have that are supposed to be here. Um, even losing a single species in a food chain can have a disastrous impact. Um, a lot of people, even though they're not endangered by any means or threatened, um, prairie dogs, a lot of people are like, meh, prairie dogs, why do we need them? They are keystone species, and without them, we wouldn't have dozens and hundreds of other species, plants, um, reptiles, amphibians, uh, black-footed ferrets that eat them, swift fox eat them. So if all those prairie dogs went extinct, hundreds of other species would be at risk. Um, it also maintains those natural ecosystems. It improves the overall quality of life, and overall, it's just an invaluable benefit to protect our threatened and endangered species. All right, that's a good kind of stopping point. That was a lot of like heavy information. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about our Nebraska threatened species next, but are there any questions that we need yeah, to Yeah, we had some questions in the chat. Um, so we had a question about um, stocking of trout and why, why we stop trout if there's a potential for harm. Good question. Um, I am going to be very honest here. Um, trout bring in a lot of money. A lot of people want to fish for trout and everyone that buys a or wants to fish for trout buys a license. So it brings in a lot of money. Um, and I'm not saying that every single trout um, does damage um, because they don't, but they do sometimes compete with other animals. Um, I also really trust our biologists here at Game of Parks. So if they truly believe that trout are, are harmful and they're not um, maintaining good populations and good ecosystems, they would not stock them. Um, so clearly they are doing okay um, and other animals are not uh, necessarily adversely affected by those trout. So good question. All right. Oh, All right. and that plant, uh, it might be the one that was on your slide, it might be a northern pitcher plant. Were you super interested in that, Amanda? Did you look that up? We, we had a question in the chat. And so I went and researched it because, you know, people want to know. Yeah, they want, they want to know. So one of those carnivorous plants. So, I mean, that makes it even cooler. So yeah, why not? That's absolutely true. All right. So we'll go ahead and talk about uh, Nebraska's threatened species here. We'll just mention a few of them. I'm not going to go through all 30. We just unfortunately don't have time today. 
Um, but we'll go ahead and start off with one. Some of you might know it is called the piping plover. So a little tiny, cute little bird here. Um, state listed, they are considered a threatened species. And then federally, they are also a, a threatened species. So not only does Nebraska see them for need of conservation, but also the rest of the United States um, federally sees them as a species in need of conservation as well. So there's these tiny little migratory shorebirds that are found along the Platte River um, east of Lake uh, McConaughey. So you're going to find them east of that area. They're kind of blackish sand colored here and then they have that black ring around their neck and a little black band on their head. Um, a lot of this bird's reason that is on a threatened list is because of habitat loss and destruction from channelization of the river. So um, if you know anything about our rivers, this is not what they looked like when Lewis and Clark came over or when Nebraska wasn't even a state yet. They are very channelized. They've been moved. The streams have had flow decreases, increases. The, the quality of the water has changed. There's a lot of different things that have uh, messed up with our rivers. Um, and also irrigation, construction of reservoirs, all these necessary things can have at adverse effects on these little birds and a lot of other species. Um, so what are we doing to help these animals? Well, in Nebraska, a lot of, um, we hire a lot of temporaries and a lot of um, conservation technicians, they will go out and flag nesting sites. So they will go find um, these nesting sites so that no one destroys them. Um, and a lot of the times they will um, build their nests on gravel mines or in um, parking lots even sometimes. Um, and so what they do is they flag the nest so that no one breaks the eggs and no one um, disturbs that area. Um, they will also at times place fencing around those nests to protect those eggs from predators like raccoons or foxes, that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of it, a lot of t &E stuff comes down to educating the public about this species. So this is what they look like. A lot of people think they look like killdeer and no one cares about killdeer, I guess. And so they, they just don't think anything of it. But if people know what they look like, if they know what they sound like, if they know where they're making their nests, um, people can make better educated decisions then about saving those species. All right, here's one a lot of people do not know we have. This guy is found in the very southeastern part of the United States, or found, sorry, in Nebraska. Um, Indian Cave State Park is a great place to find these. We have a southern flying squirrel. Um, state listed in Nebraska, they are considered a threatened species, but they are not federally listed. That is not saying that the, the federal government does not care about these animals, but it's just saying that they don't see at this time that that animal needs to be listed. Um, it's very common actually in other states besides Nebraska. Um, they have these very large, big, huge eyes because they're nocturnal animals. So it helps them see in the dark, lets as much light in as they can. Um, in Nebraska, they're found mostly in hardwood deciduous forests, kind of again in the Southeast part of Nebraska. Um, they're very limited in the range simply because we're a prairie state and we don't have a lot of um, deciduous forests. We have a very small portion. We have a lot of grass instead. Uh, so what are we doing to help them? Well, we're trying to maintain our forests as much as we can. They also utilize dead trees. So even though they might look like an eyesore, they might not look the best, they might be dangerous to some people, we want to retain those because that is what these animals use as their habitat. We also tell homeowners in that Southeast Nebraska region um, to minimize your tree removal. So again, even though it's an eyesore, it might be in your way, you don't like it, um, but those animals can use that as habitat. Um, also erect nest boxes. So you can build specific nest boxes for the Southern flying squirrels. And then a huge predator of these animals are cats. So we always tell people, keep your cats indoors. Cats are the number one killer of songbirds. Um, so uh, we wanna make sure that we keep our cats in if possible. All right, another animal that we have as threatened um, in Nebraska, but not federally, is the lake sturgeon. So um, these sturgeon are actually very neat. There's only been a few of them found um, during broodstock collection, um, but they get very large. If you get a chance, uh, Google search them and see how large they can get and see if you can find um, a picture of next to um, a human holding them. It, it's a huge size difference, um, but they're very cool animals. They have these little shovel looking noses. Um, we have three different types of sturgeon in Nebraska. Um, this one is probably the most rare that you're gonna find. Um, one of the main reasons that we just don't have a lot of them and they're on the threatened list it takes about 14 to 16 years just for males to be able to sexually reproduce. So they cannot have babies for at least 14 years. 
females take almost a quarter of a century. So 24 to 26 years just for them to be able to have babies. Um, to top that all off, it's a very late um, sexually mature rate, but they can only spawn every three to six years. So not only does it take them 25 years for females to be able to reproduce, they can only do that every three to six years. So they don't produce a lot of babies in that time frame. Um, so they're listed as that just because we just, they, there's not a lot of them. Um, in 19 out of 20 states of these original ranges, they are listed as either a threatened or an endangered species. So they could be one of those that could be on the endangered list. Another reason is that there's an overabundance of non-native fish, changes in that river flow and water quality, and they're just not super common in Nebraska. So sometimes species are listed just because the specific state that they're in, there's just not common. So they are a species that we want to just kind of watch out for. All right, Western Massasauga, this is our only, um, what used to be our only um, threatened uh, reptile that we have now in Nebraska. Now we actually have another one, and I believe that it was just um, passed to be a um, proposed threatened species. So I think it is already there, but just in Nebraska, not federally. It is the smallest rattlesnake in Nebraska. They're found in southeast Nebraska in the tall grass prairies, mainly in Jefferson, Gage, Pawnee, and Thayer counties. Um, there's a, and I can't for the life of me think of the name of the place right now. Um, Burchard Lake. There we go. Burchard Lake has always had a good population of Massasaugas there, but their biggest threat is that habitat loss. Um, they will actually overwinter in crayfish burrows, um, so a lot of their grasslands and a lot of their wet meadows have been converted to croplands or the marshes have been drained or they flooded or there's been pond construction and it takes out their habitat. So that's their number one reason. Uh, so what are we doing to help them? We are prescribed burns. So managing those prescribed burns, uh, people might think, why are you burning their habitat? Well, we are not sort of, we are burning it, but it's making the grasses better. Um, it's getting rid of all those really bad invasive plants and species that we don't want. So those other native animals and plants can grow in that area. All right, Western Prairie Fringed Orchid. This is a threatened species in both state and federal. Um, this is one of Nebraska's rarest plants, but it's very, very pretty. Um, this plant is about 60% decrease in its range in the tall grass prairie. So it's an Eastern side of Nebraska um, species. Habitat loss is a primary reason and also converting native, native prairies, um, again, and grasslands to cropland. So what are we doing to help them? Um, we're over, or what are we doing that is causing these animals to become threatened or plants to become threatened. Um, there's an exotic plant invasion. There are tons of invasive plants where um, people are annually haying their areas. Um, they're overgrazing, they're using herbicides, um, lots of different things that can hurt these plants. Um, so that requires active management. So again, prescribed fire, carefully planned grazing, invasive plant control. Sounds a lot easier um, said than done, but still um, that is what we're gonna do to help. Also, we have to maintain um, habitat for their pollinators. So not just the plants themselves, but how are they gonna reproduce? So we gotta make sure that we keep an eye out for their pollinators as well. Another reason that we have such an issue with these is because Nebraska is 97% privately owned land. A lot of the times when we do find these orchids, they are on private land. So we have to work with private landowners saying, hey, can we manage your land? Can we do this? And a lot of people sometimes are not thrilled with people telling them how to manage their land, um, or they just simply just don't know what's on there. And um, that can hurt the species as well. All right, so again, we just went with a few of them. Um, so now we'll go ahead and talk endangered. Uh, but do we have any questions about those threatened species? Um, we were excited to learn more about sturgeon in the chat. And I love we sturgeons. Were, we were having great debate about the flower again. So, so oh, don't, okay. don't mind Man, us. that flower. I'm, I'm glad I kind of put that little Easter egg in here so people could talk about that. So, um, someone asked, where do lake sturgeons live? Good question. Um, most of the time in Nebraska, at least, it's going to be very, very close to the Missouri-Iowa border. They very kind of rarely come up 
past that. Um, in the past, when they've done like broodstock collecting for pallid surgeons, um, the past, I think three years, there's been maybe a couple caught, not saying that we don't see them otherwise, but um, that is their attempt at doing some surveys and they have for sure found them. So um, we do have them, but they're in very, very Southeast part of Nebraska in the Missouri River. All right. All right. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and talk about endangered species now. So a little bit higher up on the scale as far as from threatened to endangered, these animals do have the potential to become extinct. Not gonna happen, but not that we want it to. Um, whooping crane. So this is like the poster child for endangered species. Um, a lot of people, especially in Nebraska, always think of these animals. So this is the tallest bird in North America. They are considered a state and federally listed species. Um, their feathers are gonna be white. They're very tall birds. Sometimes people get them confused with sandhill cranes. Sandhill cranes are a little bit more um, ruddy and they're more kind of a grayish brown color. These guys are white. And then when they fly, their wings tips are black and you can see that when they're flying. Um, there's only one, as far as we know, non-reintroduced population in the world. Um, that doesn't really give us a lot of hope. At one time in 1942, there are only about 16 birds left. I think the last time I read there was like maybe 400 now, 800 now. Um, so if you see one in Nebraska, you are very, very lucky. That is a cool species to be to be seen. Um, they don't live here permanently, but they migrate through using that central flyaway, the same um, migration route that sandhill cranes will use. Um, central Platte, Middle Loop, North Loop, Niobrara Rivers, they will all use those as foraging grounds um, when they come here in the, well, soon, springtime, March, April time. Um, a lot of the reason that they have such a hard time, um, people have overhunted them, over harvest them, and then destruction of their nesting habitat. So again, they could come back after a year of being gone and migrating back in and they find that one of the wetlands that they used to use is now a shopping mall. So very hard for them to um, find a new nesting area or a new nesting ground. Uh, so what are we doing? We are extensive habitat protection and management. Um, in Nebraska, we're really, really working on restoring and protecting those roosting sites along with the foraging habitat when they come through in the, in the spring. All right, cute little swift foxes. Um, these guys are listed in Nebraska as an endangered species. However, federally, there is nothing listed. So these are the smallest canines in North America. Um, they estimated only about 44% population of their historic native range. They used to be everywhere all the way from Canada um, to I think Oklahoma, but now it's a very, very small portion. Um, in Nebraska, you can only find them in the very southwest corner of the state and the Panhandle region. Amanda, have you ever seen a swift fox out there? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Yeah, yeah, you I have? was eating on something dead on the road. So that's cool. That's yeah, cool. they're pretty cute. Um, so a major reason for their decline is their habitat destruction. Um, and then a lot of the things that they eat, people don't like. Um, so for instance, prairie dogs, their major prey is prairie dogs. So there's a huge um, increase in agriculture, which leads to a decrease in prairies, which leads to a decrease in prairie dogs, which is what swift foxes eat. So therefore less swift foxes. So you see it kind of all works itself out in this long food chain. So it's not just affecting one animal, it's affecting many animals. Um, so what are we doing to help them? There's regular grazing and burning of short grass prairies. Again, making sure there's no shrubs, no trees that are invasive. Um, making sure that we have healthy ecosystems for these animals to live in. Um, people also will manually remove trees and shrubs to get rid of their things in their habitats. And we're especially making sure we don't do this in prairie dog communities because that is their food and we don't want to hurt their food source. All right. Pallid sturgeon. This is my favorite Nebraska fish. Um, very pretty fish. Um, this is a little different than our lake sturgeon. These guys are a state and federally listed endangered species. They get a lot bigger um, than shovel nose sturgeon, but a little smaller than our lake sturgeon. So kind of in the middle. Um, they're kind of a whitish kind of pink gray color. They have these long torpedo shaped bodies. Very, very, very pretty fish. Um, the problem with these guys is that males, again, they have a very long sexually mature rate. So they don't even reproduce until they're about seven to nine years old. Females can't even do it till they reach nine years old. And then they only do it every two to three years or every three to five years. So again, they just have a very low birth rate. They just can't really keep up for all the changes that they're seeing in the ecosystem. 
Uh, these guys are found primarily in the Missouri River in Nebraska, but I think some of them have been found in the Elkhorn River as well. Um, and then some of the places, the tributaries off the Platte as well. Um, these guys are listed because of they've had extensive habitat modification. Um, there's a lack of reproduction. There's a lot of commercial harvest as well. Um, you can take shovel nose sturgeon, which are smaller and they're pink. Um, a lot of times people don't know the difference. So education is a huge component of these guys because simply people sometimes don't know what they look like. Um, there's also an overabundance of native fish. The flow of the rivers have changed. The water quality has changed. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has done a recovery priority management area. And one of those areas, there's four of them in the country. One of them is the mouth of the Platte River. So that is good because that is where a lot of our pallid sturgeon kind of reside. Monica, we were wondering on our sturgeon friends, yes. are they smooth or are they scaly? They I are know really, go, go ahead. I was going to say, I know you've handled them before. So yeah. that was one of the questions in our chat, if they were smooth or scaly. Um, they're very rough. So the, the scales that they have are almost like little sharp bones. So it's really hard just to hold on to them. I would probably, you would have to wear gloves. Um, so one, they're slippery, but two, it's also because of their really sharp scales that they have on their body. They're almost like bony plates. Um, so good question. All right, our Salt Creek tiger beetle. A lot of people have never heard of this animal. Um, this animal is the rarest insect um, one in the world, one of the rare, rarest insects in the world because they are only found in two counties in Nebraska, Lanca Lancaster and Saunders County. So um, if you live in either of those counties, be congratulatory because this is one of the world's rarest insects where they live. So state and federally listed as an endangered species. Um, this animal has a lot of issues because of the stream channelization with the Salt Creek. Um, it's changed a lot of their habitat as well. Within those two counties, there's only about 15 acres, even less, of suitable habitat for this animal. So this could very well become an extinct species. Hopefully not, but you never know. Um, efforts at the Omaha Zoo and Lincoln Zoo have been working to actually raise the beetle larva in captivity and then release them as adults. So um, very cool project that they've been doing. Also lots of education efforts. There's annual surveys. They monitor their health and the status on their remaining populations. Um, and it just kind of depends. Sometimes they find a lot, sometimes they don't. Yeah, and Nebraska is home to a lot of tiger beetles. Yes, there's yes, several there's... different species. This one just likes a very specific habitat. So yeah, even though this looks similar, and there we have lots of those shiny blue and green tiger beetles, they're not the Salt Creek tiger beetle. Yes, good point. We do have a lot of different types of tiger beetles. All right. So super, one of our sexiest animals that we have here, some people might not care, it is the scale shell mussel. So listed as an endangered in both federally and state. It is a very small freshwater mussel. It's smooth, kind of yellowy green. Um, the females almost look like scales um, as far as their shape. Um, today it's only found in about 14 isolated populations in Nebraska, kind of by Yankton, South Dakota. Um, and the reason that they're so important is because they filter and impact the water quality. Um, in that area. So they want to make sure that we have them because they are cleaning the water for numerous other species. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're actually um, artificially um, breeding them in uh, hatcheries, especially in places like North Platte Hatchery, and then releasing those um, baby ones into the wild. So um, that's one of the management plans that Game and Parks is working on. All right, blowout penstemon, a very pretty flower. A lot of people have heard of it. Um, this guy, it's only found in a few counties in the sand hills um, because it has a very specific habitat requirement. It needs something called a blowout um, as far as a um, sand area. So it's basically an area where sand has been, like I said, blown out. So um, they really, really need a specific area. Um, they were even thought to be extinct in 1940, but then they were rediscovered in 1968. Um, there's actually a pretty good success story with these guys. They have grown um, really good in numbers. So. Um, we're helping um, improve range management. We're using those um, practices that will help heal those blowouts so they have more ecosystems and then growing them in greenhouses and then um, planting them later in hopes to re um, up those, uh, increase those plant numbers um, in their natural populations. All right. 
We have a couple more slides. There's a lot of information today, so we might go just a little bit longer. Um, but any questions or anything here? Someone said, yay, Pensamen, their favorite. Very cool. <laughs> We, we had a, a question about um, what happens, you mentioned in recovery areas at the plat for sturgeon, and they wanted to know a little bit more information about um, what happens at the recovery areas um, on the plat for sturgeon. So as far as like what happens with the animals or what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is doing? I, th I think, yeah, why, why is it a, a recovery area? What, what happens there? Like, is it habitat expansion? Is it, you know, what makes it a recovery area maybe? That's a good question. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has done. I didn't find a lot of information. I just saw that it was one of those four management areas for the country. So it could be habitat modification. It could be habitat extension. It could be breeding efforts. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I would have to look that up. So um, someone asked, I see, how do mussels help clean the waterways? So they actually act like a filter system. So they bring in that um, the water and then very similarly to a filter, they will kind of um, filter out the sedimentation, the bad water quality, things like that, and then spit out the good water. So the more mussels we have, the better wallet water quality we will have. All right, so we have a couple of proposed species that Game and Parks has looked into um, possibly making a threatened or endangered species. Um, in 2018, 2019, Commission actually held public gatherings and hearings, some of you might have been at some of those, um, to recommend a few species for either listing or delisting on them. So um, what would happen then is the regulations kind of changed. They were brought to the Board of Commissioners on January 22nd of 2020. They either said yes, they either said no. Um, so what happened is is there was um, three main species and then four species of fish. Um, one that was called, it used to be the McGowan's long spur. Um, it's a bird, but it now it's called, I think, the thick billed long spur. Um, it was proposed then to be a state threatened species and it passed. The timber rattlesnake now joins our Massasauga rattlesnake as being the two um, threatened reptiles in the state of Nebraska. And then the river otter was actually asked to delist it off the threatened species uh, list because we are they're doing pretty well. So there's a success story. Um, and then four fish were proposed, the flathead chub, the plains minnow, the sicklefin chub, and the western silvery minnow. Very small kind of little fish. Um, all of them except for the, the sicklefin chub, um, I think that one is still in, um, in, in the queue and listing here, but I know the other ones were kind of dismissed as getting listed. All right, so I want to talk just a few success stories because listening to threatened and endangered species can be very depressing and exhausting and thinking, okay, well, there's no hope. There is. There actually is very good success stories. Even here in Nebraska, we hear about, oh, you know, there's more tigers now in the world. We hear there's more uh, primates in this area. There's this that we've never seen before except um, there's a lot of stories even in Nebraska and our species that have done very well in Nebraska. So I kind of want to mention those, but any questions or anything like that? I don't think, okay. All right, so what are some success stories in Nebraska? Uh, North American river otter is one. We just said that they were delisted as far as a state uh, threatened species. At one time, we had zero river otters in the state of Nebraska. We likely think this was due to unregulated trapping and habitat alteration. By 1904, they were gone. We had zero of them. Um, in 1977, however, one was actually found accidentally trapped near the Republican River. So they thought, oh my gosh, do we still have river otters here? Um, and then in 1986, they were very, very small population. So they were listed as an endangered species. Um, then NGBC began a reintroduction program between 86 and 91. And we actually borrowed and never returned, but borrowed um, river otters from other states. And we released 159 river otters to hopefully boost our, our populations out there. And it was very successful. Today, otter populations are growing. They've expanded their original range and the reintroduction. They're very high survival rates. Um, and with that continued habitat conservation, um, hopefully they will continue to be a success story. 
Uh, pallid sturgeon are another one, even though they're still on the endangered species list, that does not mean they're doing poorly. Um, so 11 years, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, the fisheries division has done what's called the pallid sturgeon broodstock recovery effort. Um, so basically what happens is a bunch of volunteers will come out, they'll go on boats, they set trot lines hoping to get um, fish to come bite them, bite the worm, they will evaluate them, they weigh them, and if possible, if they're ready to be reproductive, they will be sent to a hatchery in hopes that they will mate then and they can release those babies back into the river. Been very successful. Um, in 2018, when this was the last time they did the study, that's why it's a, almost two years old now, 90 pallid sturgeon were collected, including 16 potential wild fish that were of recovery or broodstock um, maturity. And then in April, Gavin's Point Dam um, held 11 reproductive females and 13 males. They had some good mating. And then the spawning efforts occurred from April to May. And the babies were then stocked that fall back into areas where they were originally captured. So all adult fish were released back into the river. Um, and then some fish were even surgically implanted with telemetry tags, um, which is okay. It doesn't hurt the fish. Um, but this is so that we can find them later on. How far have they moved? Have they grown? Um, have they bred? So this is all good information that we can use to better understand these animals and help um, in the future grow their population. Another great um, thing that we are working on is freshwater mussel rearing. Um, so more than half of all freshwater mussels in North America are either endangered or threatened. So Game and Parks has decided the hatcheries um, are raising endangered plains pocketbook mussels and then releasing them back into the river. Um, they have a very interesting life cycle. Um, I didn't know this about mussels. Um, they don't just sit in the ground and reproduce in the ground. So if you are a malacologist or a mussel biologist, um, what you will do is um, you will help them rear the mussels by capturing um, larger mussels, the females, and then taking out this special sack that holds the babies. And one mussel can have 200 to 300,000 babies, one muscle could produce that. So they put them in a container then, and then what they will do is to um, begin their life cycle, they will attach them to the gills of largemouth bass. So they attach them to the gills and they put the gills and um, the fish are in the gills and then they will put the fish into the hatcheries, raise them up until a little bit larger. And then when they release the fish um, into areas over time, when the mussels mature, they will fall off of the gills of the fish and then plant themselves in the bottom of the dirt of the sediment. And that is where then they will stay so that they can um, again reproduce and hope that the cycle keeps going. So um, even when they get a little bit bigger, people will mark the shells so we can see, okay, this one has grown two centimeters or this one actually moved. Um, that kind of stuff. So again, all good data and all good information that we need to help that population. All right, I just have one more thing to mention, and then I will go back to questions. So within the state of Nebraska, um, we have a special document that is called the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project. Um, this sounds very uh, official. It is basically our state wildlife action plan. It is basically saying it's a blueprint um, for conserving our Nebraska species, our plants, our animals, and our habitats. The goals of this document are to reverse the decline of our at-risk species, and this is for only Nebraska listed species, um, recover the currently listed ones and hopefully get them to be delisted, uh, keep common species common and conserve our natural community. So it's revised every 10 years. It's a very large document here. I have one that I'll show you here in a second, um, but 2021 is gonna be the next major review. They did one a few years ago as kind of a supplemental guide just to kind of review things again, but their big overall extension is gonna happen in 2021. Um, so when we look at this document, it's huge. It, it covers every single um, species that is at risk in Nebraska, and it either labels them as a tier one species, which just means that they are globally or nationally at risk, or a tier two species, which means they are at risk within the state of Nebraska while doing well in other parts of their range. You can actually view this if you are curious um, online for free at NGPC website. It's like a 400 page document. So just FYI before you go and try to print that. 
um, I will show you a picture of it here. Um, the next week, I guess that is all I have. Um, next week, be sure to join us for Science of Wetlands. Uh, we will have Ted LaGrange, our wetland biologist, and then Grace Gard, our aquatic education specialist, uh, be talking about the different types of wetlands, where you can find wetlands, what's in wetlands, what are they do, all the cool stuff about wetlands. Same time, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's our last one. So usually I have a bunch of lists here about the ones coming up, but this is our last one next week. And then we will restart back in May, May 13th, I think. All right, so if you're really excited, you really like this, um, and you want more um, information, check out our Nebraska Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. Um, we post a lot of different webinars and informational videos on here. There's lots of different playlists. We are recording this one today, and it will be placed on that Science of playlist tomorrow, probably afternoon. Um, we also have a Facebook page, um, Wildlife Education, and then an Instagram page as well that has some fun facts, um, information, workshops, events, everything you can find. And then we also have our main page, um, outdoornebraska.gov slash wildlife education on the main Game and Parks page. All right. Thank you. That's all I got. We can do questions now. Um, and then we please join us next week for wetlands. All right. So we, we had a question about uh, wanting to see river otters and where, where might there be good places to go see a river otter? Um, best place to find a river otter is where there is a river. Um, and I'm not trying to say that to be sarcastic, but they have grown their population so well, you can almost find them in any um, river or tributary body of water um, within Nebraska, all the way from the Elkhorn River to out west. So pretty much anywhere you could find them. All right. And our other question is about Salt Creek tiger beetles. We have a couple of them. Um, we wanted to know, did they ever live anywhere else or is Salt Creek area kind of around um, Lincoln, their, their stronghold that we just wanted to know more about Salt Creek tiger beetles? Yeah, um, as far as I know, they haven't lived anywhere else. They kind of stick to that salty area just because their their habitat requirements are very specific and that saline wetland or the salty wetlands that are out um, kind of north of the interstate there, that's really the only place that they can inhabit. So as far as I know, that specific species hasn't lived anywhere else. But like Amanda said, there are lots of tiger beetle species that can live anywhere in Nebraska. So. Our, our next one, we're fascinated by sturgeon in the chat as well. Okay, totally fine. Um, we're wanting to know how long they live and, um, you know, how many eggs they might lay. Lots of information about sturgeon. Um, I'm not sure on the egg portion here, but I do know that they live a very long time, um, sometimes 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Um, if they're in captivity, like if you ever go to SRAM, um, they have some touchy um, touch stations that you can see. Those animals will probably live a very long time just because they don't have to deal with predators or changes in the river flow or anything like that. So they have a pretty easy life and they get fed a lot. So, um, but a long time. Right. And we were we were wondering if you could elaborate. Um, again, the orchid is coming back up that plant. Okay. Um, and at least from what I know, and maybe um, my friend Lori, if she's still on from Scotts Bluff, typically I think orchids you have to get them, buy them, or get a sprout off of them. We can't grow orchids from seeds. I know no. that's the easiest way to propagate, but yeah. Unless you're like an orchid specialist, I don't think so. Every time that I've seen people buy orchids or try to buy them is it is that sprout or it has to be a, a small little plant or sometimes you can even get the larger plants too. So um, again, definitely not a uh, plant expert or orchid expert by any means, but that is my guess too, so. Well, we could, we could ask one, don't we know? <laughs> we got we a horticulture friend, right? We do somewhere, um, yeah. And if someone's really interested, I could always ask Jerry Steinauer, our botanist uh, for the state, so. Right, and um, another, we're going back to the tiger beetle. Um, so they wanna know what would be affected by the extinction of the Salt Creek tiger, tiger beetle? Like why? Why do we care? Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, this is actually a very good debate. There's a lot of people, um, especially with a species that is this small and has this small of habitat, people often wonder, you know, why are we spending so much money every year or so much time every year to try to get the species to thrive and survive? Um, the best answer that I can give you, giving a 
non-opinionated question here is that they are part of the ecosystem. They are part of that native food chain. So something, I'm again, not a salt creek tiger expert. If you want to talk to one, I can certainly give you the name of our zoologist who loves tiger beetles. And um, he will actually be talking next Wednesday about all about them. So, um, but he uh, always tells me that they're part of the ecosystem. If they disappear, something else is going to happen. Again, I am not an expert. I can't tell you exactly what, but some other animal, some other plant, part of the ecosystem is going to be affected. So um, we have to think about that with any um, endangered or threatened species or any species that matter. If a house mouse were to disappear, something would, bad would happen because that animal is just no longer there. So um, that's the best answer that I could give you. Right. So along with that, we have a question. What can we do as citizens to help our threatened and endangered species in our state? Um, a lot of different things. Um, as simple as shutting off your lights when you leave the room, don't letting your water run, um, being educated about your animals in our state. Um, you know, like we talked about our tigers, our elephants, our rhinos, polar bears, those are all great animals, but they're not in our state. You're more likely to see these animals and you are living in Nebraska. So make sure you educate yourselves on the animals that are in Nebraska. Um, you can also hold um, Endangered Species Day is coming up in May. And you could also hold um, like a big festival or getting people interested in these animals are going to see these animals if possible. So um, there's very, very lots of cool things that you could do to help, very minimal things as well. Um, plant native plants, do a pollinator garden, um, shut off your water when you brush your teeth, um, shut off the light when you leave the room. So very, very small things can have a huge impact. Okay, people are in love with sturgeon, so they recommend you need a, a, a science of sturgeon. I would totally be okay with doing that. So we then, wanted to know um, pallid sturgeon versus lake sturgeon, size-wise. What, size, what's the difference? Uh, lake sturgeon are going to be huge, like three hundred pounds sometimes. Um, pallid sturgeons in Nebraska they only get average about nine ten pounds, so fairly smaller in size. Uh, seriously, if you have a if you have a second um, in a minute here, whenever uh, Google search just lake sturgeon size, and there are sometimes people like next to them in a river, and they look like a leatherback sea turtle. They're just ginormous fish. Um, if, if you ever go to SRAM, they have a very cool thing by their touch tank. They have the three sizes all put up in a like a plexiglass plastic, and you can see the shovel nose sturgeon, the palace sturgeon, and then this huge long lake sturgeon. So there's a huge difference in size. Awesome. Yeah, you. I second the science of sturgeon series. So maybe put that on your list. Yeah. For, for next and if time. you guys are interested, we did do a Nebraska fish science of last year. Um, and that is on our YouTube channel where we did talk a little bit about um, the pallid lake and um, shovel nose sturgeon in there as well. But I could totally do a science of sturgeon. Good. Right. I and I think that. Heidi was nice enough to share some uh, sturgeon information from the Outdoor Nebraska website. So thank you, Heidi. Hey, thanks, Heidi, for for putting that in there. Um, for folks that want to learn a little bit more, that website is safe. It's not, you know, spam or something like yes. that. <laughs> Heidi's right. cool. Um, <laughs> but I think that's most of the questions that we we have in our chat. I think yeah. you've gotten most of them. So. Yeah, and I'm actually going to stop recording here um, just because it is kind of past our hour mark. We had some really good questions, but um,